All right, now it's going down, people. We are, I, I told you, we were going to bring you closer. We were going to bring you into individuals' lives. We were definitely going to give you the exclusive, never seen before interview from Mr. Paul Johnson. I mean, you you asked for it, you got it. Everybody run up to myself, run up to the rest of Paul's DJ buddies, asking them questions. We sick of the questions, people. P.I. guy, that's that's our man, 100 grand, but you asking the wrong people the questions, man. We don't even know the answers to them. So we got the legendary DJ producer extraordinaire, Mr. Paul Johnson himself, live. So therefore, you know, we just going to get right into it. You know, first of all, uh, you can go ahead, introduce yourself, let them know who you are. Man, you got me in a fucked up situation. I'm in a hospital chilling. Imagine that, trying to get well. Um, yes, you know who I am, I'm Paul Johnson. I mean, we understand you don't talk to you don't talk to the general public a lot. I mean, they see you at these parties. They I know talk to you. my fans, but I don't talk about myself. Right? Know? Can can he get it on with my three girls at once? You know, yeah. you know these chicks want to know that, man. They, they None of them answers <laughs> out. Oh man, that's what I'm saying. But the people don't know, so we got to <laughs> give it to the people. It was straight. I mean, my my parents raised me right. But as that's happening, you got all your friends that's being raised, however they're being raised. Mm -hmm. You get together with all your friends, and some mischief is going to happen. Actually, we used to have uh, competitions in the neighborhood, and everybody bring their records and their headphones. I'll just come with headphones. And people be like, what you doing? I said, I'm just going to mix with your records. <laughs> so I'll just mix and beat them with their own records, man. You know, That's how I got known real quick in the hood. So everybody knew who I was, and then I moved. The thing would go off with. Um, I didn't do anything. Either. I don't think so. Check your dirt, Steve. This is alarm. Check two and dressing. Pull, pull it. The little canister. Pull it out a little bit and push it back in. Which part? Just yank it out a little bit and push it back in. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, wow. oh, I see what it is. Oh, okay. What you doing, Steve? <laughs> Man. Skip. I mean, <laughs> you said that. I don't think there's none of y'all for it. All right. All right. Back to it. So, he said he was battling people with their own records. He was coming to the, he was coming to the party shutting cats down. We're gonna have to turn it, just turn it off until we get through. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's an off road. You sure about that? Shit. Where it says therapy off and on? Yeah. You mean turn it back on? Shut down. It says therapy off, continue therapy. You gonna turn it on? Leave it off until we do it. Alright. I don't know if we're just gonna keep on beeping. Um, Alright, where I left off at was uh, right battling people and you know that's how I got known through the hood because I would battle people and win with their own, own records so then uh, my mom used to let me and Eric Martin throw parties in, in my basement. Big ups to E. Martin. Right, and then that just grew real big. Everybody was coming from other hoods to party with us. You know, Steve and them was doing the big parties was, we were, so we'd do our little parties. And then run to see to, to get them to see their big parties. So it was all working good, man. And then um, in '87, that's when I got shot. It changed everything. I didn't know what I was going to do out there. I didn't know if I was going to do anything. You know what I'm saying? Now, now, know when you, now, when you say get shot, like how exactly did you get shot per se? Because that you know that's what a lot I, of I got know. shot. I was in my basement mixing. I cut school early. And I came home, I had some tracks, I think a couple of them was his, that I got on the cassette from one of my boys. Acid Tracks was one of them, but it was all original tracks. So I couldn't wait to get home and spin the tracks off the, uh, the cassette. So I'm doing that, and this is one of the times my mother let me throw parties every day after school. So I was getting everything ready for everybody to come home. And my friend from across the street came over and he heard the music. He came down to dance. So he was dancing, he showed me, he was like, uh, you know I joined the folks, which is a gang everybody knows that. And 
he um, had a gun in his waist and he was dancing with it. And I'm just watching him dance with that, like, man, if that goes off, my mother killed me. And Antoine shot himself in my house. So I told him to take the bullets out the gun. And as he was doing that, he pulled the clip out. As he pulled it out, the gun went off. And it just so happened that I was in the line of fire. When it popped, it hit me in my shoulder, hit me in my, uh, my lung, went through, hit my spine, and then came out stuck in the wall. So it was a quick build. I mean, split second. But whatever the whatever it holds true is the fact that when you get shot, when you think that's happening, you know, when it, when it actually happens, your whole life does flash before you. I mean, when from the time I heard pow to about five, maybe five or ten seconds later, that's how long it feel like it took me to fall. And I, everything just flashing through. Everything that happened to me from the day I was born. And then, mm -hmm. and then I hit the ground. It was crazy, man. And then uh, it felt like a car was on top of me. But the first thing I did, I was like, man, I can't feel my dick. I can't feel it. <laughs> I didn't care about nothing else. I couldn't feel my dick, man. I was, I was like, no, nah, man, I can't move. I couldn't feel nothing, but I was only worried about that. Because you know that. Come on, right, man. Right, right, right. He's 16. That's our pride and joy. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was worried about you that. 16? Yeah. I was worried about that for a long time. Man. Everything started slowly coming back. Slowly coming back. And then, I'll say when I got to about 20 or 21, I was cool with that. Now, at what, at what point did you realize that that you couldn't walk, I mean, because did you go through a stage where you were trying to rehabilitate? And yeah, to well, walk? the way the way the bullet chipped the area of my spine, I pretty much figured that it wouldn't be a chance that I walked through them. But the doctor said it would be a 50-50 chance. But I just looked at it how, as how it just shattered it, you know what I'm saying? So I knew it wasn't going to happen. Just me knowing, I knew it wasn't going to happen. So I got used to being in a chair right away. It was me, it was me, Michael Earhart, Armando, Rob, and Derek. And we just hung out and did everything together. I got a story about Armando, I wish he was here. We um, went down, we drove down the tracks records on 38. It was closed, and we wanted to get some records out of there, so we didn't know what to do. And we looked in the record bin, and he had just pressed up Move Your Body. So we jumped in the record bin, trying to find all the best Best copies of Move Your Body. Got about 200 of them. Put them in the back of his, uh, the back of his uh, trunk. And this Mexican cat saw us, man, and started chasing us. Armando pulled off in the car. While me and Mike was running down the street holding a box of records. He getting chased around. Every, every few seconds, you see him go this way, go this way. <laughs> he going this way, and me and Mike crying and laughing at the same time, and we don't know what's gonna happen. And then we finally catch him right on Halstead. And then just jump in the car with him man, and go back to the crib. And did y'all still have the records? Yeah, sold all of them, sold them for a dollar. Tell, tell, tell the younger guys, you know, technology nowadays, man, you, you could buy one self-contained box to do it all for you. Tell these guys how you got down with the MIDI game. Because when I got in the game, that's what I'm saying. I mean, you, had the MIDI. You, you told me how to hook all my stuff. I mean, you got to tell we, these cats. We MIDI everything together, all the machines that you can pull up and Reason and, and all these other programs that come up in a stack like this, all those machines that came up in a stack, we were using the machines for real. Still to this day, I like to use my analog machine because you can touch and turn on your own. You don't have to click a mouse and try to get that feeling. So most of us still do it that way. I mean, I used to make stuff together that you didn't think could do it. Like I, I, I figured it out so well that I could turn down all my pads on my drum machines 
and then make those samples. You know what I'm saying? I, I turn those down, put the numbers to, to match the sampler to the drum machine, and hit the drum machine, and then it would be samples played, but no drum sound. So then I figured out how to MIDI the keyboard to the 909, and when you hit the 909 keys, it's different key tones. So you, you can play that, you can play it as a 909, then flip it, and then play them key tones, and just, we was doing all kind of stuff. But then along came the MPC 60, you know what I'm saying? He swore by that, people. We tried to convert him. He wouldn't touch the conversion, man. He he still banged that, that 60, man. He had his the, the, 3, the, the 3,000, right. The, the 3,000 came along. It was over with for me. <laughs> but this shit, I'm not the only one, man. You know, Drake got 12 of them. <laughs> it's Dr. Dre used 12 of them. I'm just using one. Kanye used a couple of them, too. But, man, it's the best machine to me, man. It got the best sequencing. It got the best channel you know you can it's so much you could do with that machine like nah, no this is tight this is this is my work of art right here i uh i play violin section on the keys seven different seven different sections and then you know i sing now so i also sang all seven of those sections and i put them on top of that and then i got uh mike levin to play the flute for me and it just took off from there. In the beginning of the track, you can hear the violins playing by themselves. And at the end of the track, you can hear my voice playing by itself, doing exactly the same thing as a violin. So I like to do that now to show people that my, my voice range and how I sing. So this track is nice. Uh, for some of the promoters out there, you know, uh, a lot of people, you know, uh, fans and promoters, some of the promoters, you know, may have a negative taste in their mouth about, you know, Paul Johnson don't, you know, may not show for my party or we book him and this may not happen. I mean, that's why we wanted to kind of get on that, get on that subject is that they actually get a chance to see that you deal with more than the average person actually get to get a chance, you know, average person don't deal with that, you know what I mean? So, I mean, you dealing with a little bit more, a lot bit more than what the average person deals with. I mean, this guy is because we look at you as just being P, you get what I'm saying? We talk to you, you know, we trip out, we joke. It's all, you know, we don't look at you the same way, you know, everybody else looking there when you don't show or you just may not feel well that day or it's just one of those days for you. You don't get, you know what I'm saying? They don't understand that because they look at you as just being P too. They, they when they book you, they look at you as being booked just like Steve Hurley. You know, if Steve didn't get on the plane, ain't no different than Paul Johnson getting on the plane. Oh yeah, I, I've had to tell people that, man. Just because we did the booking, you know, I still got this part of my life to deal with. And this part of my life takes over 80% of anything. The other 20% is friends, bookings, and music. 80% of my life is my health. And ever since I got shot, my health has been doing this. And I don't ever take that out in the street with me. You know what I'm saying? I'm always smiling when I'm out in the street. I'm always doing everything everybody wants, you know? But when I go home, I'm hurting. You know what I'm saying? I'm hurting from this, I'm hurting from that. I can't do this, or I wanna do this, but I can't for a couple of days. And don't nobody understand that, you know? So if I miss a booking, and I mean I'm sorry when I miss a booking. Cause I don't want to miss it. I'm trying to get there, but my body can't get me there. You know, so it's um. I mean, it is what it is. You know, so, you got to take it as it is, right. and so just please. make make do a makeup. I mean, I tell everybody that if I can't make it, we got to make the party up. But I still want to play it. I mean, and just for the people that don't know, I mean, you can even tell the individuals here in the camera right now, the different promoters that that have done business with you over the years. I mean. Come on, people. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's almost, uh, you know, it's a shame we had to go to this, you know, go to these extremes to kind of get the point across. But this is a real situation. You know what I mean? This is real life. You know, a lot of times you you you, you see things and you hear things, and it's just, it's not real life. You know what I mean? Like this is this is real. This is as real as it get, man. But I mean, we're sitting here having an exclusive interview with my man in the hospital. You know, and it almost has to come to this. You get what I mean? For people to even understand or even take the take it as serious as it is. I mean, 
they realize that you're a phenomenal DJ. That's why they book you. You get what I'm saying? That's why you get the booking fee that you uh, demand. That's why, you know, the production, is, they know that you're producing hit records, bottom line. But then they don't even look at this side of it. They don't understand that, hey, you know, this guy is really dealing with a lot, you know, a lot of life. You get what I'm saying? Not just a lot, but just a lot of life in general, you know. And I mean, just for the people, I mean, you can even give a disclaimer right here. Just let them know, the promoters, that you're not stiffing them. You're not trying to steal their money. You're not that. trying to do any of the bugs. It's, it's never that because they always get their money back. You know, I don't, I, it's never that. And sometimes promoters book me without even asking me. You know, I've had a dozen times where people call me telling me they're going to see me at, tonight at a place <laughs> or I can't wait to see you next week in Denver when when I was never supposed to be there in the first place. So promoters still be on some, you know, for real. It happens a lot, man, using that name. They're using that name and just they know people going to come to that name. And next thing I know, I get bullied out for it because I didn't show up to something I didn't even know. Be laying in the bed watching the White Sox game and the phone ring. Where you at? I'm in the bed. What's up? You're not at the airport? What airport? <laughs> Where am I supposed to be? You know what I'm saying? What are you talking about? That happens so much, man. It happens so much. The name get tossed around. And it, it makes it bad for the one time when I would miss a party. You see what I'm saying? On my own, the one time I would miss it. Add on to the other three when I never was supposed to be there. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And now everybody's mad at me. So I just stopped taking a lot of bookings, man. Because I want to go to the Army. That's my main thing. I want to go to the Army when I got out of high school. And uh, I, I was dead set on doing that. And I think God slowed me down. Like, nah, I got something better for you than going to that Army. So why, why did you want to go to the Army? Just, I was just, my, my father was in it, my uncle was in it, and it just, I just felt like, yeah, that's something I could do too. You know, I like the, the discipline factor and mm -hmm. just all of it, you know. So I was ready to be, yes sir, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you weren't an ROTC, <laughs> mm -hmm. you just wanted to go I just, to the Army. Yep, I just wanted to jump right in, man. But um, he was like, no, nah, you can't jump right in, pow. Take a little break right here. All right, now come over here and start messing with these machines right quick. This is what I want you to do. Because I, I still don't know how I do any of that, man. I haven't took, never took nothing for nothing. I never read a manual for none of the machines. And I still don't read manuals. When I get machines, I don't read the manuals. I just turn the machines on and press the buttons until <laughs> I get it. Happens. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And I, I always do everything backwards by troubleshooting. That's the best way to learn. Instead of saying, um, I want to do this, say, why can't it do this? Why can't I make it do this? And then go back to the troubleshoot and then you get it, you learn it quicker. So I still do that to this day.